Welcome to another episode of Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya. Hit subscribe, please. We'd love to have you with us for every episode. I've made it very clear that I am a daughter of a public school teacher. My mom taught for most of her life in the public schools, and I admired her greatly for that. I'm also not afraid to tell you that she's very disheartened with what she sees in public schools today. It's interesting. We're the United States of America, and each state is supposed to be a lab of ideas that other states can use if they see it working or say, no, that didn't work very well over there in Vermont. We're not going to use that. And I just say Vermont because it was the first state that came to mind. Okay. So don't make any assumptions that I'm down, down talking Vermont. I'm not. Here's the point. The federal government got involved in public education in 1980 when it formed the Department of Education. The Department of Education, the federal government, finances about 8 to 10% of public education, right? So the main, that means the rest of the funding comes from the states, the localities, et cetera. But for only funding 10%, they have a, sort of an outsized influence on what gets taught, what is attached to that money, et cetera, et cetera. So should the Department of Education still exist I mean, we're not doing so well as a nation with our public education, and that's becoming clearer and clearer every day. Should it just go away? Should that be part of the administrative state that we say, you know what, don't need it? And and how do we make that happen? These are all really interesting questions that we're going to discuss with Sherry Few. She is the founder of US Pi, and that stands for United States Parents Involved in Education. She believes parents should have more of a say in what their teachers are learning. And I, as a parent, I agree with her. I may not agree with everything that she says, but I agree with this notion. Parents need to be the parents. School teachers and administrators, they don't need to be the parents. And even if parents aren't experts in education, they are experts in their child. And they know what they want for their kids. And I'm not sure the federal government always shares the same values as the parents. So this is a very interesting question. We're going to get into it next with Sherry Few of U.S. Pi. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. Sherry, so glad to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. As I said in the introduction, the Department of Education is not that old. It was established in 1980. And you can almost <laughs> correlate that moment with a decline in American education. What is U.S. Pi's position on the Department of Education and, and, and why? Well, it's our mission since our inception as an organization about seven years ago to close the U.S. Department of Education and end all federal education mandates because there are federal um, in, intrusion into uh, local schools beyond just the Department of Education. There are lots of federal agencies that have their tentacles into the local school districts. So we believe that that is important because that is the origination of most of the nefarious pedagogies that we see being pushed on local school districts and often incentivized with federal dollars. So even though the average school district or the average state only receives about 10% of their education budget from the federal government, they tend to control 100% of what happens in the classroom. So as you said, it hasn't even been around that long, but it's done an enormous amount of damage. And the things that we're seeing today are just um, in your face, ridiculous. And, and we're glad that we saw it before others began to rise up against it. Um, but we've been leading the fight for seven years. And most of us were involved with the fight against the Common Core Standards back in 2010. And, you know, we lost battles in our state, regrettably, after years of work to end these Common Core Standards. And that's when we um, collaborated across the country 
to form this organization with this mission because Common Core, like other nefarious pedagogies, have originated from the federal government and, and again, uh, incentivized with federal dollars. Okay, for the benefit of my listeners and for me to learn, I'm going to play the devil's advocate and and ask and and ask questions that I think the opposition would would try to come at you with. All right, so okay. education is a good thing. Teachers are teachers are good. This is all good for our kids. Uh, they care about our kids. Um, you know, this is the education is the foundation of the future of our country. How can you say that the federal government should not be involved? Well, first of all, um, there are some good teachers and there are some bad teachers. And I think um, more so now than ever, there are teachers that themselves have been indoctrinated and misguided through not only the K-12 system, but we've known for decades that the post-secondary uh, education colleges and universities have been steeped in liberalism. And so these young teachers that enter the classroom are fully indoctrinated and believe that what they're doing is correct. And so, you know, a lot of the good teachers, the older teachers have left the profession. And, you know, we hear a lot of talk about um, teacher recruitment and, and retention. And so we, we don't think the problem is a lack of pay. Um, we believe the bigger problem is what's being taught to children. And the good teachers have said, I'm not doing this anymore. I, I have a personal friend who taught school for 20 years and I ran into her recently and she's moved into a private school because she couldn't tolerate it any longer. Mm -hmm. It violates everything that she believes in and she knows that it's causing serious harm to children. So our schools have evolved in this country and it's happened incrementally over time. Um, I've been involved with education policy for more than 25 years and so I've been following the trends and you know it, it was a slow creep but now it is on steroids and and what is happening in government schools is harming children and it's harming our country. It threatens our very freedom in this country if we don't stop the indoctrination of children in government schools. I want to say again that my mom spent her entire career as a school teacher. I admired her greatly for that. And now she sits back and is really saddened. Uh, dispirited, disheartened, frustrated by what she sees in the public school systems, or as people want to say, government school systems. And, I, and I, it's hard for me to see that from her because she gave so much of her life to what she really believed was educating kids, giving them skills, uh, giving them useful tools to manage the world and their future and their jobs. But now what we see is uh, people coming out of schools and looking for jobs, and one of their priorities when they enter the workforce is to be socially active. Um, anecdotally, a friend of mine runs a business. He said he had 700 applicants for a particular job, and he was amazed at how many people said to him, well, what are your social causes? And, well, what we're really trying to do is sell our products. Yeah, but <laughs> you don't have any social causes? Well, we're big into, you know, conserving the environment. Uh, but well, what about, you know, social justice? No, we're not really dipping our toes. In. Oh, that's disappointing is the response that he would get from people looking for jobs. So this, as you've detailed, as you kind of articulated here, it starts and it goes through the student. And if they become bent on this, they want to take it into corporate America. And we've seen corporate America going, I'll use the term woke uh, all over the place. Um, the, the Department of Education, wh why was it formed? Can you give us sort of a, a, a historical context for why it, I mean, what its purpose was? It, again, it didn't happen until 1980. That's not that long ago. Well, I think the purpose um, originated, you know, it, it came from um, the Democrats, but we have to admit that Republicans are just as bad on education policy as uh, the Democrats are, but originated there, you know, with the idea that somehow the federal government could support um, local school districts, uh, states in their efforts to educate children. Um, you know, there was some accountability measures that 
came into play. And that's why the Republicans uh, became very heavily involved with pushing things like No Child Left Behind to try to, you know, and, and so Republicans are about accountability. And I get that. We want accountability from our schools. We spend tons of money in this uh, country on education and there should be accountability. But the um, idea was that you would have outcome based education. And that's that's what the trend has been ever since the Federal Department of Education was formed, was to have what what we call outcome based education. This come in many forms. Uh, but the idea is that somehow children will have the same outcome. Every child should have the same outcome. And, you know, that's just not possible because every child is an individual. Uh, not every child puts in the same amount of effort. And it is it is really sad because what they ended up doing was lowering the bar. Uh, so because they knew that they yeah. couldn't bring the low achievers up. So they just lowered the bar and and ex and that way could expect that each child would have the same outcome. So it was originated for that purpose. Yeah. And we've seen the flawed programs that have come. Uh, no child left behind. There was school to work, um, common core standards. And, and now the big push is critical race theory. And as you suggested, um, they are turning children into social justice warriors. This is exactly what their goal is. And, and we're seeing it evident in society. It is so sad because the bottom line in my heart is they're teaching children to hate themselves and hate others. I mean, it literally is this. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we hear now, you know, the big talk is about the, the mental health crisis with young people. Well, hello, yeah. you fill the children's mind yeah. full of nonsense <laughs> about themselves and others. And then you're surprised when they have mental health problems. So it is, it is definitely an insidious hot mess. There is a great link on your website, which, by the way, for people is USPIE, USPI.org. And there is a link to a man who's got two medical degrees. I watched it again this morning, who talks, and he's black, and he talks about, you're telling me that I got two medical degrees in a society where the white man supposedly is holding me down. And I reposted it today on my social media channels because it is so important to watch this. And, and you're not exaggerating. And I've been challenged on this by many people. Oh, where is the critical race theory? Where is it? From people who don't have kids in school and they don't see it yet, but it is there. Um, and perhaps it is more pervasive in public schools, although I would say that there are private schools that it has crept into as well. Uh, more with Sherry Few in a moment. Um, I want to get into this Millstone Award that you are now giving out. This is something sort of new for your organization, plus how people can find their way to you. That's next. Hey, if you're tired of looking tired, <laughs> I'm the president of that club, and that's why I rely on GenuCell, G E N U. CEL. This is a phenomenal skincare line and they are antioxidant based skincare company, which is really cool. Um, made and manufactured right here in the USA, formulated by a pharmacist with quality ingredients. Their products are sure to smooth out fine lines and wrinkles while preventing new ones from forming. And my personal favorite is the deep firming serum with stem cell technology. This stuff is so cool. You just put it on your cleansed face and suddenly your skin feels brighter and firmer and plumper and just altogether younger. Right now, you can save over 70%, think of that, off GenuCell's most popular package. This is just in time for this warm spring weather that we're getting, right? It features GenuCell's Ultra Retinol that contains a powerful retinol alternative, safe on your skin in the summer sun, and GenuCell's Dark Spot Corrector to reduce the appearance of dark marks and sunspots from those long summer days outside, which we love. We just don't love the effects sometimes. Plus, you'll still get GenuCell's classic under-eye bags therapy for those annoying under eye bags and puffiness. And with its immediate effects, see results in as little as 12 hours. That's guaranteed or your money back. Don't wait. Visit GenuCell.com slash Michelle to save over 70% off their most popular package. Plus, every order subscription includes a luxury gift box with two free springtime essentials. That's two free gifts, plus free concierge shipping for a limited time. So again, it's GenuCell.com slash Michelle, G-E-N-U-C-E-L 
dot com slash Michelle, and it's Michelle with one L, M I C H E L E. Go save over 70% now. Well, it's the award you never want to receive. It's called the Millstone of the Month that US Pi gives out. Um, Sherry, what's behind this? Why did you create it? What is it about? Well, we just hear so many outrageous stories around the country about school districts, school boards, teachers um, who have just committed what we think are, are crimes against children and society. So we thought that it's time that we start bringing attention to this. And we came up with sort of a whimsical way of doing that. And we've tied it to um, a Bible scripture found in the chapter of Matthew, which says that if you should harm, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, if you should harm uh, children, that you may as well have um, a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. So we even had a graphic designer uh, develop a, a nice logo that gives projects this image. And so we're just warning and, and bringing attention uh, warning individuals and bringing attention to the culture um, of these things by finding the most egregious story each month and uh, making this award. So that's why, as you mentioned, it's the award you would never want to receive. Uh, mostly we want to highlight individuals and in school boards who have not been called out. Um, in some cases, you know, just this week, we were talking about an incident in Florida where a teacher was allowing fights to happen in the classroom and was kind of um, yes. having yes. this yes. whole fight scene. So, you know, while that in itself is egregious, um, that teacher was fired. And, and so she was adequately punished or she or he. And, and so we're more interested in the cases where these individuals and boards are affirmed or ignored or people don't know about. Um, so... Uh, this so is actually tell us who our won your, 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 right. This is your yes. first one. It was uh, given out on March 31st, correct? Correct. So for the month of March, we gave the award, the Millstone of the Month Award, to the Pooter uh, School District in Colorado. And we awarded the Pooter School District because they passed unanimously a resolution in support of Transgender Awareness Day. And so in in the board meeting, there's a video of it um, on YouTube where they even bring in their LGBTQIA plus coordinator, you know, a little alphabet soup there. They keep adding letters. I'm not even sure what IA stands for. Uh, but nonetheless, they brought this coordinator in and she brought students in that were non-binary and identified as transgender and, you know, have all these cute pronouns and they spoke in favor of it. Really, it was really sad to watch these young children who have been um, manipulated into gender dysphoria, which is a mental illness. You know, a mental illness is defined when someone thinks that something is true that is not really true. And that's obviously when you think you're not the gender you were born to be. Um, and you believe that that's a mental illness. And so the sad, saddest thing I heard from one of the students who uh, was in support of this resolution was she said that the biggest problem, and, and she said she came out as a transgender five years ago. And you can imagine it probably wasn't a big, big deal as it is today. And she said the biggest problem was what she called um, transphobia on behalf of, par on behalf of parents. So this whole concept that they are promoting is parents are bad people. They, they, are, they are being um, harmful to their children because they will not allow them to go through these what they call gender affirming uh, therapies. And so that's why in a lot of cases, these school boards and districts are um, doing these things behind parents' backs. Quite often, they are instructed not to tell parents that they have children engaged in using uh, new pronouns and gender affirming um, therapies. So, yeah, that's why we awarded this school board. You know, again, they voted unanimously in favor of this. And it's just so right. sad that they have embedded this in the very fabric of their district 
to believe that it's true that a child can be opposite of the gender they are born to be. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said you emphasize child here. We know, uh, I mean, we've seen Caitlyn Jenner go from being Bruce Jenner, a gold medal decathlon in the Olympics, to, be, tr- to being transgender, now Caitlyn Jenner. And even she is very outspoken about kids. She says that she has felt transgender since she was six years old. Uh, that is her recollection of it. But what I have a problem with is this explosion that we're seeing at the moment. I mean, this is was seen as a rare thing. Now, we, we can argue this, right? We can say, well, kids felt that way, but they were shamed into staying with their their biological sex, on and on and on. But the point is, and I think this is where it gets important, this is not a school matter. This is a family matter. And you can say, oh, yes, but some parents won't allow it or they're going to demean their kids. Or uh, The schools are not the parents. The parents are the parents. And when the schools and teachers and administrators step in and try to become the parents for these kids, that to, that, that to me, that step alone is egregious. This is not to say that every child grows up in a healthy household, that every child has parents who care, that every child has parents who are going to allow them to express that. This is not to say that, but this is where we get into really touchy territory that if you allow the schools to supplant the parents as the affirmers, caretakers, um, and you hide this from a child's family, this is, you know, I, I, this is outside of religion for me. This is, this is tearing at the fabric of families, which is one of those things that many people point to as a Marxist approach to, you know, separating people from their roots and just making them feel like they're kind of a number out there. And, and, and anyway, it's, it's, this is really interesting to me. And it's, it's, um, I don't like the direction this is going with teachers intervening. Parents are parents. I, I, you know, I, I, so I, I, you see, I kind of get speechless over this because I don't want to tell anyone they can't identify as whatever they want to identify as. But your brain is not developed until you're about 25 <laughs> years old. And so for mm-hmm. to say that kids can have this kind of control over their future is, is, a, is a not a great idea. And, and unless the parents are on board and say, you know what, honey, if you want to identify this way, that's good by us. But it's not the school's responsibility, nor is it their prerogative to step in and, and do this. And I think that's what you're really talking about here, right, is that schools should not supplant parents. Oh, ab- absolutely. I mean, that that's the bottom line. And it's the bottom line across all the issues that, that we're addressing. And, and in the film that we've recently produced, which we'll hopefully get a minute to talk about. But so, you, you know, first yes. of all, we have to realize that there's also a movement out there that is counter to this. And it's called detransition. So there, there are um, young people and young adults who are speaking out now who went through some of these therapies where they actually mutilated their body in order to um, turn into another gender. And now they regret it horribly. And these are things you can't undo. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's bad on right. children, right. as you pointed out. Very young children are being exposed to this. I mean, in kindergarten through third grade, I mean, that's why DeSantis got beat up for what they call the don't say gay bill was because he simply said, K through three, it's off, you know, it's, it's off limits. You can't do that to young children. So you can imagine very young, they're putting these ideas in kids' heads that they never would have thought about otherwise. Now, when, when they become a little older and, and, you know, hormones change and things like that. Um, children are very vulnerable at that age. So even the middle school child who's just beginning to go through puberty is confused enough it is, as it is just being a normal child. And so 
pumping this nonsense in their head is really damaging, really harming. So your point is good that that if you're an adult, it's different. You make decisions about your life on your own. Um, but parents need to be involved with this. They need to protect their children from the school's indoctrination and, and potentially um, health treatments. I mean, who would have ever thought we'd be living in a society where children are being given health care behind their parents' backs? It's just absurd. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's even there's yes, even adult is. groups that that are opposed. You you mentioned um, Jenner, how she, she has spoken out or um, there's also a group called Gays Against Grooming. And they say the same thing. They say this is an adult decision. It's not for children and shame on schools for trying to groom children into these type lifestyles. From Affirm Films comes Big George Foreman, the miraculous story of the once and future heavyweight champion of the world. Based on the true story of one of the greatest comebacks of all time and the transformational power of second chances. Big George Foreman, starring Chris Davis and Academy Award winner Forrest Whitaker, rated PG-13, may be inappropriate for children under 13. Only in theaters beginning April 28th. For tickets and showtimes, go to BigGeorgeForeman.movie. So Sherry, the film is Truth and Lies in American Education, produced by the United States Parents Involved in Education, U.S. PI. And there are other chapters and people can can look at the website to find that. What's the goal of the film and how do you accomplish it? Well, the goal of our film is to educate people about what's happening in government schools. So not just parents, parents obviously need to know, but also taxpayers and freedom loving Americans. Uh, we're paying for this. And, and paying at a high price. It, I mean, the cost is astronomical, not just financially, but the future of our country for the health um, of children and being able to protect children from these uh, nefarious pedagogies. So we want to educate the public and motivate them to become involved to help us end what's happening. Now, it's been, as we talked about earlier, it's been an incremental um approach to this point, uh, but it is really uh, wide open now. People have to see it. They have to understand. You know, like you said earlier, people will say, oh, well, they're not teaching critical race theory. Show me where it is. Well, we have every bit of evidence that it's embedded in every subject at every grade level. And this film exposes that, not just the Marxist critical theories, but the sexualization of children like we've been talking about. We have uh, one cast member who started a nonprofit organization, a legal uh, pro bono firm that's protecting families from uh, the types of situations we just talked about where children are being harmed uh, without their knowledge. And so it's that widespread that you've got a national organization that is protecting families from this. So we have some great uh, cast members, all-star cast, people like Alex Newman and um, uh, Dr. Carol Swain and Dr. Gary Thompson, and they are exposing the truth. And another piece of it that we haven't talked about is the inaccurate history that's being taught. Uh, and so children are being taught anti-American propaganda. They're being taught to hate their country. And then it's no wonder when we have a younger generation that thinks people like Bernie Sanders will make a good president because they've been taught that socialism is great and communism is cool. So our very freedom is at stake here. And that's why we want people to see this film, understand what's happening, be motivated to join our grassroots effort uh, to stop it. And so it truly is a grassroots effort with our organization. Some of these other organizations, these parent groups have been popping up in the last few years, are obviously well funded by some big organizations. Uh, you know, you go to their website and they have 15 staff and um, we are truly grassroots, all volunteer. We have two part-time individuals that work for us, 
but but we need the help of others across the country and that's what the film is hoping to motivate we currently have 22 state chapters and we are growing so once people are able to view the film you know at the end of the film we direct them to our website we ask them to look for a chapter in their state or to help us to form one in their state because it's going to take that kind of a movement um, to put it into this. It is it is a huge task, but it is not insurmountable. We have a plan, and that's another good thing about our organization. We don't just talk about closing the Department of Education. We've taken the time and researched and developed a blueprint for how to do that, and we're currently working on a blueprint for states on how they can wean themselves off the federal dole. So the film is very important. It is the, the first step which has to happen is you have to understand and recognize um, and accept the fact that this is happening and then uh, get into action and help us to put it into it. And the film's website is truthandliesfilm.us. And we hope that uh, individuals will uh, purchase the film, um, watch it with other families, uh, watch it in your community and maybe have a forum and discuss, you know, what you're going to do and um, really just use this as a tool to to get active. You know, we're, the schools are turning children into social activists. Well, we have to be activists and fight this uh, this indoctrination of children. Well, Sherry Few, I thank you so much from U.S. Pi, and you can find them at uspi.org. And you can also go there and look at the trailer for this film. It's important work, and I admire you for, for, for doing it at this grassroots level and wish you continued success, Sherry. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate you having thank me you. on. You bet. Thanks for listening to Sideline Sanity. Don't forget to be brave, stand up to this kind of stuff, and do good for your children and for everyone around you, your families, your communities. Thanks for listening to Sideline Sanity. We'll see you next time. <laughs>